Okay, we're recording. Well, welcome you guys. And um, we've got a special guest today. Roy Moran is a great friend of mine. I consider him a mentor. I remember years ago when we were first being introduced to DMM, somebody gave me Spit Matches. And you guys, it's a book he wrote. If you haven't read Spit Matches, you've got to read Spit Matches. It is a powerful book. Definitely set us on fire. Roy, I think I finished the book and I immediately emailed you and just said, we have got to talk. Roy was the only one I had ever heard of in a North American context implementing DMM. And uh, so he's been at it a lot longer than, you know, really probably any of us. And so he wrote to me and I know to many people in uh, the um, different communities in the U.S. that are catalyzing movements. So he's a pastor, senior pastor at uh, Shoal Creek in Kansas City. Some of you guys are aware of that, Kansas City, Missouri. And, um, and he hosts a, a monthly sandbox call. I think that, I know, Sean, you went through one of his trainings and you may have been on those and some, some others have been to those. So Roy, I always tell people that Roy is the ultimate connector. When I got to know Roy, I got to know everybody else I needed to know. Okay, so now you guys can say, y'all know Roy because you're here today. And I'm sure he would be glad for you to reach out to him about anything you need, but he can connect you with, uh, you know, whatever resource you may need. Or if you have a question about your implementation of DMM, He's the expert, okay, especially in a North American context. So I've invited him to just come and share with you guys. I said, Roy, share anything on your heart, but definitely we're interested in a DMM in a, a well, a, it was a North American context, but now a North American and a European uh, context, a Western context for sure. And uh, Roy just always has great insights into kind of where we're at, where we need to go, what our focus should be. So I'm going to let him share for a few minutes, and then you guys may have some questions as he shares and we can take those. And then after that, we'll break into our groups and do some accountability. So Roy, welcome. We're glad you're here. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. Um, the uh, the uh, love fest goes both ways. Uh, Chris is one of my favorite people. In fact, uh, he just called me about uh, an hour and 30 minutes ago and said, hey, do you have 10 minutes on the phone? And, and 45 minutes later, <laughs> we got off. So uh, no, it's uh, thanks, Chris, so much for what you're doing, how you do it, and uh, your friendship means the world to me, man. So I appreciate you having me here. So it's uh, great, great to be along. Um, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm usually more uh, uh, used to responding to questions. Um, I always uh, approach a context like this, believing I don't really have anything to say. Um, uh, it's the the learner in the process that has the need. Um, so um, I'll just say a few things and then uh, if you guys have questions you want to throw in the chat uh, I'll feel free to respond to those kinds of things uh, as well but um, you know I think um, uh, when I got into this process uh, I was uh, talking to Dave Hunt as a guy at City Team and I was trying to ask him I had, I had been with the city team folks, I'd been introduced to these guys, uh, all the stories and miraculous movements that you read about, all the real people behind it. And uh, I was just, uh, it was like, um, you know, a kid in Disney World or something. I mean, it's just like incredible seeing this kind of stuff happen because I'd always had this kind of great commission heart about me and stuff. And so I just started um, and, and I remember writing Dave and him saying, uh, and he was a real busy guy. So I said, Dave, I, I don't, want to take your, much of your time. Just give me a few names. Just give me a couple of names of people I can call and talk to uh, that are a few steps ahead of me in this process, and, and I'll leave you alone. And he wrote back finally, and he said, you know, I wish I could give you a few names, but uh, I, I think you're the only guy that I know that's really, you know, in a, a Western church trying to implement DMM, and it was like, great, you know. I've been on the bleeding edge a few times in my life. And uh, the last thing I wanted to do is be on a bleeding edge again. But, uh, you know, the, the, the Great Commission is just too compelling. You know, it's, um, I'm, I'm 65 years old. I'm ready to give whatever life I have left, you know, to see this thing happen. Um, and I'm a little bit like the disciples uh, when, you know, Jesus said, are you going to leave me too? And he's like, where else would you go? You know, I, I, where would we go, Jesus? I don't, I don't know any place else to go at this point, but just to keep, um, pushing ahead, but um, I, I'm, I'm encouraged by the, you folks here. Uh, I don't want to be discouraging, but uh, I, I do feel like uh, I, I've been at this uh, the better part of 12 years, and it's like pushing a, a boulder up a hill. Um, you know, it's like a Sisyphean type task, you know, it's like always pushing, always pushing and, and never engaging. But a um, couple of things I've learned, I'll just throw those out, and then we'll open it up for questions. And um, you know, I've learned that um, 
that you can't take a strategy uh, from one context and put it into another context without thinking hard about uh, why it worked in one context and why it's not working in another. So um, my, my deepest exposure has, has been in Eastern Africa. Um, my dear friend Isla Tassi and the cascading movements that have happened there. And, and for me, he's like the gold standard of, of uh, movement catalysts. Um, and what I learned, you know, in, in being able to be deeply embedded in those movements there is, is that they live in a connected context. Um, and uh, as, I, as we came back and began to train people, help them understand what it looked like to find persons of peace, to plant the gospel, so that it repeats, you know, and where they live, learn, work, and play. And we discovered that we have such a disconnected context in the U.S. And so right off the bat, uh, we, we saw four generations um, happen in a, in a typical American white suburban neighborhood. Um, but uh, we discovered it happened because we had a phenomenal leader. And you discover this after a while, you've been around movements, uh, really, really passionate, power, personally powerful type people can get to four generations usually in one stream, not, not multiple streams. They can get in one stream. Uh, and she was able to push that, um, but it stopped dead in its tracks after four generations and just went dead. And then we came back at it and did postmortems and, and came back to look at what was going on. And we discovered that our neighborhoods that we're trying to reach are so disconnected that trying to to let the gospel move from along relational lines was difficult because there weren't any relationships. And so we had to realize that we had to build relationships in these connect these contexts before we could let the gospel move. So we began to help people understand what it was like to, to build a neighborhood, um, to build relational connections, to build the kind of community amongst people that neighbors had. And then we were able to leverage those relationships to begin to start. And, and we got back to uh, four generations again in that process. So, um, you know, one of the big learnings for us was is that we don't have a lot of community to tap into, a lot of uh, natural social networks to tap into. And so oftentimes, we have to build those before we can access them. The second thing we learned is that, um, in the is especially in the West, I think this would probably be true of England uh, and, and, and all of the West, uh, but in the US, especially Canada, um, there is a genetic component to an American's DNA that has a definition of church in it. Now, I'm not talking about someone who's uh, hell bound or heaven bound. I'm not talking about the redeemed and the unredeemed. I'm just talking about, you know, the average U.S. person. Now, this may be not true other places, but, um, and, and so when, when they begin to journey spiritually, there's this natural attraction to this thing called church, which usually has a very poor theological definition to it. It's a box on a corner with a label on it. Um, and so, we discovered that it was very difficult um, to, to see people come to faith and, and then not get them to get on a church track. They quickly discovered Christian radio, Christian TV, Christian uh, conferences, Christian uh, uh, podcasts, all kinds of stuff. And, and the DNA began to, uh, as a result of them being exposed to other types of Christianity, the DNA began to be diluted especially the multiplication DNA, because most collective type churches, you know, churches that collects people on Sunday morning uh, don't have a multiplication DNA in them. They, they may use the word, but, but their, their methodology speaks so loud um, that they can't get their message across. And so Marshall McLuhan, who was a Canadian, was right, you know, um, uh, the method is the message in that sense. And so uh, we, we discovered that the way you do things is oftentimes as important as is what you say. And, and so uh, that, that was a hard thing for us to realize. And especially in that, this hybrid world, um, you know, we, we have this, we used to have this Sunday morning gathering. Uh, COVID seems to have destroyed that, but uh, uh, w which might be a good thing actually. Um, and, and, it was difficult for people uh, to get out of that. Our, my good friend, Harry Brown, who's the president of New Generations, always, always says, you know, what you're one with is what you're one to. And so, um, you know, people come to Shoal Creek on Sunday morning and they hear Van Halen and this really wild guitar solo. We don't have smoke machines, Chris, sorry. But, uh, um, you know, and, and they, they hear this wild music and this uh, really, you know, uh, relevant type 
uh, explanation of a passage in the Bible, and that's what they want. And so they want to come back to that. And so the idea of getting their fingerprints on the Bible, no matter how many times we say that, uh, getting their fingerprints on the Bible and just you know, help them understand this is a great place to start, but a terrible place to stop. You'll never get traction in your spiritual journey if all you're doing is eating this pre-digested truth here. You know, you've got to, you've got to, you know, have this face-to-face -face relation with God. Because of what we did and how we did it, often people are more attracted to that because the method is the message in that sense. And so uh, we've, we've or coming to grips with that even during this COVID period of trying to figure out, you know, how to expand this microchurch network and build out, um, you know, a, a different type of ecclesia. Um, so, you know, as long, even though I've been at it a long time, 12 years, uh, um, it, I'm, I'm still in beta mode. You know, it's like everything's beta, you know, it's just, just crazy, crazy. Um, and especially because of COVID, it's, it's given us some grand opportunities um, that we never thought we'd have so early, so quickly. Um, so I'll stop there, see if, if anybody wants to pop in, ask a question or lead us down a rabbit trail. <laughs> Thanks, Roy. Yeah, you guys, if you have questions, uh, definitely post them in the chat. Uh, you can unmute in a second and ask Roy, but if, in case somebody's talking, you can post yours there and he'll see it. And Roy, I know you'd say this kind of the way you started out because of how long you've been at it. I mean, and what I try to tell some of these guys, some of these guys that have churches that have grown really quickly, you know, and one thing I think we've learned and that you're saying, you know, when you start to focus on multiplying disciples and you start looking at um, the parables that are often uh, farming analogies, this takes time. And unless you're willing to be patient and unless Roy Wright, you're willing to have stubborn perseverance, you're going to mm -hmm. give up quick. And so you guys just hear Roy saying he's been at it. He's still as fired up as ever, but it's not, it's not overnight. <laughs> it doesn't happen overnight. And what he was describing is, you know, happening overnight. He was saying, you know, it's not the case anymore. So I think one thing I've learned from Roy is we have to be patient. We have to plant seed and understand it takes time. You got to get the sun out and the rain's got to fall. You got to have an irrigation system or something. And it takes time for that good soil to yield the harvest. that's 30, 60, 100 times what's sown. So Roy, on behalf yeah. of all of us, thank, thanks for persevering and not quitting <laughs> yet. And, uh, and reminding us that we, you have to have stubborn perseverance, right? Yeah. You know, hey, it's, Roy, it's funny. Go ahead. Um, John? This is John Murray. How you doing? Hey, man. Um, so I have a question. So um, when you first started exploring DMM, how many years were you into Shoal Creek? What size was Shoal Creek, okay, at that point? And then the, the ultimate question I wanted to ask you is, if you could go back in time, what would you be, do different <laughs> if you could start right now back what, 12 years, I think you said, 12 years ago? Yeah, yeah. Good question, John. I like that question. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we, uh, in, in 2005, uh, I, I began my quest. So it's maybe a little longer than 12 years, but uh, we were uh, probably averaging, uh, if you want buildings, budgets, and butts type thing, we were averaging... Um, Oh, in the 800 to 900 range uh, attendance on Sunday morning. Um, and um, what else did you? Um, so we that's had uh, where you were at. 10 staff members. Um, now, the scourging things, you ought to ask us where we are now. <laughs> uh, 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 we'll, t we'll save that for later. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not not quite like Chris, but uh, you know we're headed that way. Um, so yeah, um, we we were uh, experiencing a, a fair amount of success in the sense is that we were uh, you know growing at a, a good fifteen percent per year clip, uh, maybe sometimes twenty five. We bought a new building in two thousand three, and it had a, a real deflection point there. Um, so we we had this real move upwards but um you know it just was a moment and if you've read spent matches I, I had this dream thing go on i won't tell the whole story for those of you that have heard it before but um um and, and you know i discovered i just realized in the dream that, that an attractional strategy wouldn't achieve the goal that we had of, of 300,000 people coming to faith um so that that, that was the uh, spiritual deflection point that put us on the move in 2005 to say, who's got a scalable model of ministry 
uh, that would allow us to reach what we're praying for. Uh, a little bit like uh, Chris's, uh, you know, uh, taking from, you know, the, the uh, David, um, help me, Chris, my old mind's going, David Garrison. Um, you know, what's it going to take? Right. You know, what, what, what's it going to take to reach my people group? You know, so our people group, we had defined as 300,000 people, the people that roughly lived in about 30 minute radius of our campus or our county, basically Clay County in Northeast Kansas City. And so, you know, we just realized that our tractional strategy wasn't going to get it. You know, we, we were doing something. I mean, we'd baptize a couple hundred people up, you know, to that point, maybe 250, 275, something like that. I've seen a lot of people come to faith. Um, but but the reality is, as we continue to pray for these 300,000 people, it, it was just not going to happen uh, in that way. 425 parking spots, maybe 1,600 people in an auditorium if, if they were jam-packed and the fire marshal kept his eyes closed. Um, you know, we could, we could handle that. And then, of course, you know, we're gonna, how many services a week are you going to do? you know, to try to, to reach all those uh, folks. So uh, it was at that point that we began the trek to look and see what was up and um, what, what might be our uh, way of, of moving forward. Um, so, John, did I, uh, I, I think I'm partway there. Yeah, the so the real question was, if you could go back, back um, in time to, uh, I guess, 2005, yeah. What would you do different given what you know now? And then Roy, okay. why don't you add to that that these two questions in the chat also go along with that, which is okay. um, with the thoughts you've shared so far, how have they impacted your thinking regarding a hybrid model of church? Okay. And I guess in the current context, do you think that the hybrid church is still possible? And if not, why not? So maybe yeah. you can speak to that. Okay. Yeah. Um, if I could go back, John, uh, you know, it's one of the learnings I wrote about in Spent Matches is um, I was the founding pastor. Um, I, I have a pretty strong personality, um, love conflict, um, love to fight. Um, and so, you know, I know what hill I'm going to die on. And if you don't want to die on that hill, then don't come up that hill because I'm dying right here. And, I, you know, it's kind of my personality. And so... Um, it was easy for me uh, to, to make the mistake of trying to think that I could start this from the front of the room. And so I did, you know, I'm on the platform and, and I was, you know, I was deceived that people would do what I say, you know, I mean, I've got, you know, this relatively successful, you know, big, bigger church, you know, and, and, and I was deceived that, you know, they all listen to me and they do what I say. Uh, and so I get up there and I say, Hey, you know, we're going to, we're going to do this, you know, and here's a training class and you all need to go through it and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and we did, we put a lot of people through it and we, we trained a lot of people, but we um, it, it, it didn't work that well uh, from the front of the room. Uh, if I could go back, I would go back and I would start from the back of the room and I would find a few people uh, who actually had uh, a strong, uh, non-believing network of friends. And, and I would meet with them. I would encourage them. I would coach them. Uh, I would build weekly rhythms, monthly rhythms, uh, personally with them weekly, monthly with them together. And uh, I, I would realize that this, when, uh, so th this is, that's one, one learning. Start from the back of the room, not the front of them. The second one would be that this, that I was not, um, adapting a new way of training or discipling or whatever. I was in the culture change business. And I didn't realize, you know, at that point, you know, one of the quotes that's become near and dear to me now, and you, many of you, you probably all seen it, but you know, it's, um, uh, boy, I should quote these things and remember them. My mind's going, um, uh, Peter Drucker says that, you know, um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And um, I, I didn't realize I was in the culture building business. And even though I had built a church that loved lost people, I mean, we regularly still to this day have people walk out of Shoal Creek on a Sunday morning because they say it's not church. We take that as a badge of honor. You know, we say, well, most people don't like church. Most people are going to hell don't like church. So if you say it's not like church, thank you. 
We appreciate that. Take your Bible and go down the street. There are 50 churches within five minutes of here that do the things that you want. But there are a heck of a lot of people going to hell uh, that live within five minutes here that need this. And so, you know, um, we're fine with that. Uh, so I, I thought we'd built this culture of loving lost people, but we'd also built a, a, a seeker church, a, a church with a, a distinct culture that said that if I want someone to come to faith, uh, I need to bring them to Sunday morning. And I was changing the culture to say, look, uh, if you want someone to come to faith, invite them to their kitchen table or better get yourself invited to their kitchen table and learn to read the Bible and help them discover what God has to say about life. So I was changing culture uh, in, in a radical way. And I just missed that myself. You know, I, I just thought, well, you know, movements are about lost people. Uh, Seeker church is about lost people. So, hey, we're, you know, we're all about lost people. So that's fine. And, and that just wasn't true. I was building culture and I didn't spend enough time understanding the cultural changes that had to take place to make that happen. So, um, I'm, I'm not sure that's really practical, but go ahead. And then Roy, to follow up, what about the, the, um, the hybrid question? Um, how, how, has, um, how has your thinking on a hybrid model of church you know, changed, if it, if it has at all? And um, especially in this current context, um, we were talking about this earlier, <laughs> hybrid model of church in the current context. How, how is your view changing and, and how, how, how would you respond to that? Well, you know, um, I, I can, res let me respond specifically and, and generally, uh, I'll just say general first. I mean, I, I still think that for many people, the, the hybrid um, church is possible. Uh, if you have an existing model that's successful, you, you can use that exist existing model as a launching base for disciple making activity. Uh, it's hard, it's culture building, it's not training. Uh, and stuff. So you realize, realize it's a hard road to hoe that way. I think that's possible. Um, I, I, I never intended, and this, this comes up quite often, I never intended for people who are starting to think about building a hybrid situation. Uh, I, if I were starting over, John, uh, I, I would not build what I have. If I were starting over, uh, I, I would do something radically different. It would look more like the uh, Kansas City underground than it would look like a you know, modern seeker church or whatever. Um, it would be a, a network of micro churches rather than anything that's in the macro um, vein. Um, so um, on a personal note, I mean, I just came from a staff meeting in which we're asking ourselves the question, um, will uh, a non-believer still come to a religious meeting on Sunday morning? And we're, and we're actually developing a survey to be able to survey our community to see if that's true. Because if it's not true, then what we do on Sunday morning is useless. And we have to pivot in the biggest pivot we've ever seen. What we do know is that most of the people, we, we have, we have uh, regathered. We're on our third week of regathering. But I, I, I got a little bit of a fear this uh, just before I got on this call, I got a voicemail from the Clay County Health Department asking to talk to the most senior person at Shoal Creek. <laughs> so you may hear about me in the news here soon. Um, uh, so uh, or or we may have um, you know we may have a COVID outbreak you know amongst us and we have to stop gathering. But anyway. Uh, as a staff, you know, we're, we're asking ourselves if we need to do the biggest pivot we've ever done in our history. And after 25 years, decide that, you know, you can't meet the needs of the seeker and the needs of the believer in the same service. That used to be, if for those of you that have any exposure to Willow Creek, and uh, should I mention his name, Bill Hybels, uh, you know, that kind of stuff, uh, it, it, that was the moniker of the, the hybrid movement. So if, um, if the seekers won't come, then Hey, what are we doing? You know, that's kind of, we have to find a different way to access the world um, in that process. So we, we've actually kind of uh, modified the, the hybrid into a tribrid. Um, and, and that is that uh, we, we have this, you know, you say come and go. And now we've got this new thing we're working with called here, there, and anywhere. Um, and, and so this, this tripart thing that actually brings in our online 
uh, presence and, and beginning to understand we have different platforms to reach people with in that process. Um, so, yeah, I, I still think, you know, one of the analogies I think I use in, in um, spent matches is, is the idea of uh, a server church. Uh, we, we still look at the resources that God has given us at Shoal Creek and we say that, you know, we're, we're a server. We're, we're going to support whatever expression of ecclesia that brings lost people in connection with their father in heaven that we can. And uh, does that look like a micro church? Does that look like, you know, um, we've got a guy here in town with a gaming church, you know, online gaming church. Uh, we'll, we'll do whatever it takes. You know, we'll support whatever we can, you know, with those resources for as long as we have them. And uh, we're not so fixed on form. I, I think form, um, you know, for, form is form. It, it's just a way to, a means to an end. And the end is, is, you know, the idea of, of Revelation 7, 9, where, where every tribe, tongue, and nation, you know, is gathered around. So I look at all of my tribe here and it's like, what, what does it take to get them to that throne? And I don't care what methodology it is, you know, I, I'm going to use it, um, whatever that, whatever it takes. And, you know, right now, you know, we, we find that this disciple making movement strategy is, is very helpful. And uh, it, it, it energizes and mobilizes people to get in the, into the game of, of reaching their friends, neighbors, and workmates and helps them express their priesthood of the believer um, capacity, you know, and stuff. So we, we feel really good about that. But, um, you know, I would say that, you know, back to the original question, Chris, um, every situation deserves kind of a unique mm -hmm. approach to it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and asking the question, not just, let's just do the hybrid. That, that, that's not it. It's like, what's God doing here? What, what resources do we have? And what can we, can we do? Um, but, you know, right now, I, I think it's a pretty good bet that m most people, believer or not, aren't coming to large gatherings. Mm -hmm. And so if I were starting now, <laughs> I definitely wouldn't be doing anything like that. That's not your main <laughs> strategy. Yeah. No. Hey, no Roy, it's, yeah. Roy, I think we have time for one more. Brent posted in the chat here, and then we'll do our breakout groups, but he asked, can you unpack what your strategy is for keeping people in a DNA of multiplication versus seeing them drift into the America culture of Christianity that you mentioned? And then what are the best practices for creating a culture of disciple making multiplication? I think those are good questions. Um, you know, I, I, I try to raise a flag for people and I, this sounds uh, extremely, um, proud maybe or whatever, but I, I just want people to question uh, the gospel that they're believing in. Um, if they're believing in a gospel of salvation, that they might want to relook at the scriptures and find out what Jesus talked about, because I believe it's a gospel of kingdom, not a gospel of salvation. If you, like our, my good friend, uh, you know, another book, if you haven't seen it lately, you need to pick it up and read it. Um, King Jesus Gospel, The Beauty of Disciple, of Obedience-Based Discipleship. I tried to get him to change it to disciple making, but uh, it was too late and Zondra didn't want to work with us. So anyway, um, David talks about in there, David Young is, is the author. David talks about, you know, most people have responded to a gospel of Jesus as Savior. And, and so their normal response is gratitude. Uh, very few of them responded to Jesus as King. Uh, the normal response to a gospel of Jesus as King is obedience, is doing what he says. And so um, I, I try to hold that up pretty high. And then here's where the, the pride comes in. I, I try to paint everyone on the other side of me <laughs> as in the gospel of salvation, <laughs> you know, um, and, and su suggest that, you know, the only way you can avoid that is, is just by reading the Bible. Um, you know, there, there's a, a small body of literature that you can trust in, but, but by and large, most of the books that you see, you know, on a, on a shelf uh, come out of that gospel of forgiveness. Um, so if you've never read King Jesus Gospel by Scott McKnight, um, 
another great book, you know, to get a hold of. But I, I try to keep people in that vein, and I try to keep force, you know, focusing them on the idea of here's the DNA uh, of obedience, here's the DNA of multiplication, and anything that doesn't smack of that. And so, um, you know, uh, um, again, I'm trying to quote people I can't remember, but some some famous <clears throat> American revolutionary said, uh, Patrick Henry said, people need to be reminded more than they need to be informed. And so one of the things you have to do <clears throat> is find creative ways to consistently remind people. Um, there is an American uh, defect, um, especially in Christianity, that says, uh, oh yeah, I know it, I, I got that, I got that, yeah, I got it, I got it. And it's like, they don't got it. They just don't got it. And so I just remind people over and over. We use the backwards bike video for those of you who've seen it. If you haven't, just Google YouTube backwards bike. I have a, I built several backwards bikes. Um, always have them in my training, get people to ride them, help them understand that learning this new way of gospeling is like trying to ride that backwards bike. And in that video, uh, the guy, Dustin, he points at the camera and says, you can't ride this bike. And it's so funny when I ask, I did, I, did, uh, I had 16 uh, navigator staff here in my house for last week, uh, doing some training on a pilot project the navigator is doing. And so I showed the video and I asked, show of hands, you know, how many of you, when he said that, you can't ride, how many of you inside? I mean, just thought, I, I think I could ride that bike. I mean, you don't know who you're talking to here. And, you know, probably five or six of them, you know, raise their hands and say, yeah, that's kind of the way I was feeling inside. That's an American attitude. You know, you see something impossible. So they think they hear words, you know, it's like, uh, so they hear a bat, they hear a ball, they hear bases, and they think you're talking about baseball when you're actually talking about cricket. Totally different games, totally different rules, totally different ways of scoring. And so you have to keep reminding and reminding and reminding and reminding them. Um, and uh, as Isla Tassi would, would tell you, um, it, you know, if you want the kind of things that are happening in East Africa, you have to commit to realizing that you train, train, and retrain, train, train, and retrain, train, train, and retrain. It's just a constant process of making sure that the culture you're building is constantly influenced by the DNA. So you, you kind of have to, you know, figure out what the DNA is too for you. You know, I think, you know, if you've gone through Chris's training, you, got, you know, the seven uh, habits there that they come out of that seven elements, you know, of, of practice and stuff, you've, you've got to keep that cadence going and you can't ever let up in that process. Um, and it gets tiring at times. I mean, it gets, I, frankly, I, I have moments of anger, even, uh, you know, at, at staff members who, it's like, oh my gosh, how long have we been at this? You don't even get this? Um, and it's like, yeah, they don't get it, you know? So um, you just got to commit to that. And, and you know, as, as Chris mentioned before about the, uh, uh, if you've ever read um, uh, Seth Godin's book uh, and his, his talk about the dip, uh, there's always a dip in this process. I mean, there's multiple dips, actually. And, and oftentimes you get in that dip and it's so discouraging. You know, I, I remember one time a guy, a pastor from the Northwest called me and he's just like, he was just beside himself. And I just let him talk for 30 minutes, you know, it's like, man, this is frustrating. This is, I don't get it. People don't get it. I mean, I don't know if it's worth it and blah, 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 blah. And he just talks on and on and on. And I said, man, it sounds tough. He goes, yeah, it is. Thanks for listening. All right. See you later. Bye. <laughs> you know, all he needed was to have, know someone just understood that, you know, it's, it's, it's tough, um, but it's worth it. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's really worth it. And so I, I love the struggle. Um, and when you see someone's eyes come on and you see someone released and you see someone begin to plant uh, the gospel in places where they live, learn, work and play, it's like, Oh my gosh, uh, I'll, I'll take all the frustration in the world over that. So. Roy. Would you guys give him a virtual round of applause? Thank you Roy. <laughs> so much for coming. And you guys, Roy, yeah, Roy, I mean, you, people probably don't tell you enough. You're, you kind of have led the way. You've paved the way for a lot of us in, um, in this context to, you know, begin to pursue this in our churches and be able to say, we're not the only ones. There's this guy named Roy. I mean, he started this, you know, and so just thank, thank you so much for your leadership. Thanks for coming. Please come back again. I'm sure uh, these folks will see in other contexts as well, but it's been great. Yeah. Thanks for well, being here. Well, man, there, there are so many other people's shoulders that I'm standing on. 
you know, uh, that, you know, like the Dave Hunts and the Dave Watsons and the David Brudricks. I think you have to have the name David to be in DMM for some reason. Um, but, you know, uh, Isla Tassi, Yunusa Jow, Aichi Bain, you know, all these guys who, who just poured into me, opened their lives and, and stuff in. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just, you know, I, I, I can't do anything but, you know, give it away because it was given away to me. So. Thanks, Roy. We really appreciate it. You're welcome, man.